Um, my name is Kathy High, and I'm the moderator of this esteemed panel. Um, in opening this panel, Symbiotic Ecologies, I'd like to say a few introductory remarks. I come here today from Troy, New York, a post-industrial town with the eco ecological and economic decay typical of upstate New York Rust Belt cities. I work with a nonprofit organization called the Sanctuary for Independent Media, which is devoted to producing community media and progressive messaging through our local low-power FM radio station and other video productions. We use art and participatory action to promote social and environmental justice and freedom of creative expression. I'm the coordinator of a project at the sanctuary called Nature Lab, and uh, we are the resident ecological education program. Nature Lab promotes sustainability, or as I would like to say, rather adaptability, and research in urban ecology using art, technology, and science. We're located in North Troy, one of the most environmentally devastated neighborhoods in uh, New York State. One block from the Hudson River and the beginning of the Erie Canal, our environmental education campus is adjacent to brown fields, combined sewer overflows, general electric PCB dumps, and more. We're interested in studying the ruderal ecologies, a term that describes how plants and animals survive and even thrive among the urban ruins. Artists, community youth, activists, scientists, and others work to create interdisciplinary teams, understanding our local ecosystems and developing and learning and teaching the skills to grow, intervene, and adapt to our new and changing urban ecologies. So the topic of this panel is very near and dear to my heart. Thinking about this panel, I've been inspired by an article written by Heather Davis and Zoe Todd, both activists and scholars, settler and indigenous, entitled, On the Importance of a Date, or Decolonizing the Anthropocene. Allow me to read some quotes from that article. The article speaks to the need for the inclusion of, quote, indigenous knowledges into contemporary discussions of the Anthropocene. We argue that a start date coincident with colonization of the Americas would more adequately open up these conversations. In this, we draw upon multiple indigenous scholars who argue that the Anthropocene is not a new event, but is rather the continuation of practices of dispossession and genocide, coupled with a literal transformation of the environment that had been at work for the last 500 years. And the authors continue, quote, by making the relations between the Anthropocene and colonialism explicit, we are then in a position to understand our current ecological crisis and to take the steps needed to move away from this ecocidal path. By linking the Anthropocene with colonization, it draws attention to the violence at its core and calls for the consideration of indigenous philosophies and knowledges of indigenous self-governance as a necessary political corrective alongside the self-determination of other communities and societies violently impacted by the white supremacist, colonial, and capitalist logics instantiated in the origins of the Anthropocene." Unquote. With these words by Heather Davis and Zoe Todd in mind, I'd like to introduce our esteemed panel. Our first speaker will be Sofia Cordova, Born in 1985 in Carolina, Puerto Rico, and currently based in Oakland, California, Sophia's work considers sci-fi and futurity, dance and music cultures, the internet, mystical things, extinction and mutation, migration and climate change under the conditions of late capitalism and its technologies. She received her MFA from the California College of the Arts in San Francisco. She's exhibited and performed at SFMOMA, Yerba Buena Center for the Arts, the Berkeley Art Museum, the Arizona State U University Museum, the, the Vincent Price Museum, and other venues internationally, such as Art Hub in Shanghai, and the MEWO -E Kunsthalle in Germany, and is part of the Whitney Museum's permanent collections, among other honors. She's participated in many artist residencies around the world. Most recently, she was the artist in residence at the Headland Center for the Arts. She is one half of the music duo Susa Santa Maria. In addition to the discrete projects, performances, and albums, 
The Duel collectively scores all of her music and performance work. And Sophia will present about her video work, Sin Agua, Expectation Crowned by Its Own Desire. The next presenter will be Jack Skira Dillon, who is a first generation academic and advocate who grew up on Treaty 6 Cree territory in Saskatchewan, Canada. Her work spans the fields of settler colonization, colonism, anthropology of the state, anti-racist feminism, and youth studies. Forthcoming, the University of Toronto Press, her first book, Prairie Rising, Indigenous Youth, Decolonization and the Politics of Intervention, provides a critical ethnographic account of the state interventions in the lives of urban indigenous youth. She is currently an assistant professor of global studies and anthropology at the New School in New York. And she will present Indigenous Youth, Standing Rock and the Rise of Anti-Colonial Entropy. And our final speaker will be Sophia Unanu. Sophia received a BA from Brown in its international development with a regional focus on the Arab world and Latin America. In Latin America, Sophia worked in Rio de Janeiro as an international relations coordinator for the drug reform campaign and participated actively in the nonprofit sector at large. In the Arab world, she studied the Arabic in Damascus through 2009 and later conducted her final thesis work, field work in Cairo during the wake of the 2001 Egyptian revolution. Sophia is a winner of the Brown University Distinguished Senior Thesis Award for this work, having witnessed the power of a collective uh, collectively activated Tahir Square and lived in Brazil during the 2013 mass protests. Sophia became fascinated by how citizens can creatively demand and bring forth more inclusive and participatory cities. In 2019, she moved back to her home country, Puerto Rico, and co-founds La Maraña in hopes of creating new bottom-up approaches to urban and community-led development on the island. Sophia will speak about Imaginacion Post Maria, Designing Justice After Disaster. Let's welcome our panel. Thank you. Hi. So my practice is pretty Baroque, um, so I'm gonna focus today on part one of the three-part video and sound work, um, Sinagua. Uh, so this work was made while in the Arizona desert and through sharing a timeline with the quasi-temporary environmental apocalypse of Hurricane Maria happening on my home island of Puerto Rico, it collapsed my perception of time and history for the duration of the production of this work. Um, through this confluence of events, um, the work inadvertently becomes linked to previous work using sci-fi as a narrative site to consider possible futures, futures um, for colored, queer, and or trans bodies, such as um, the slide up there. Um, Sinawa began upon being invited to develop a body of work at the Arizona State University Museum in September of 2017. I had just finished this installation, um, The Gentle Voice That Talks to You Won't Talk Forever, um, which looked at botanical and zoological resilience in radioactive scenarios, both real and imagined. Um, and I wanted to transpose this anti-anthropocentric methodology to the work that I'd research and produce while in the desert. Um, so, with that in mind, I focused on the fact that I was within a research institution to guide me in the development of a work around similar resilience in the desert. Um, this image, for example, is of the curator of cacti at the Botanical Gardens of Phoenix explaining how um, they paint needles to measure the growth of the saguaros, which can live up to 200 years, and how this simple and analog process uh, led them to discover isotopic radiation um, within the needles that correspond to the 60s suggesting that the cacti there were absorbing the radiation from the U.S. nuclear testing in the region and growing unimpaired. In another example, um, I met with the manager of the vertebrates collection who spent the day pulling specimens such as this. Um, and it was around this time that the uh, hurricane Maria was announced to be moving closer to the Antilles. And so the research already started to kind of fold onto itself despite my best efforts. 
Um, I pushed the fact aside that the hurricane was coming because I felt double dislocated from my supports, my parents and family being in Puerto Rico and my communities within the US being in California and New York, and kept focusing instead um, on the research, um, as well as the peculiar sensation of being a tropical body in the desert. I really tried with this work to push my subjectivity out sort of as an experimental form for myself, um, but even before the narrative of the hurricane and my family's struggles through it and concurrent emotional traumas entered the work, I was already feeling really challenged by the dryness and heat um, of the desert and became obsessed too with how water was, at least in Phoenix area, frivolously wasted in fountains and pools while there's a huge homeless population that hides from the sun all day long um, without any access to even a tap. Um, eventually, the inevitability of the hurricane's path, um, that the hurricane path was going to cover the island, completely became unavoidable fact. Um, and this caused in me a terrible sense of dislocation. Um, so following my obsession with water, I started tracing the histories of who brought the water to the valley, the Hohokam tribe, um, and who erased, this, uh, who erased them and their engineering marbles, early conquistadores followed by Mormon settlers. Um, the buildings then started in a way to feel simultaneously like strange ruins as well as monuments to this violent history and I started to see all of this as kind of time collapsing onto one. It was at this point um, that the piece in a sense started making itself. Um, I felt completely possessed um, by the anxious waiting for the hurricane to hit, as well as waiting to hear from news um, of my parents who had insisted that I don't come home because there was nothing to be done. Um, so my research really started to reflect this collapse and the research and personal narrative started um, to blur together. So archival footage uh, started blending with the movies that I was watching and the fictional histories of colonial erasure and these became inseparable um, from the real colonial erasure that I felt I was presencing in real time through the research and sort of experience of being in the space. Um, all of this eventually became Sinagua One, expectation crowned by its own desire. And this is a 30-minute work that is scored with field recordings exclusively and voiceovers from sort of my diaries at the time as well as research. Um, I'll mention here briefly that the title Sinagua serves a double purpose here. Um, the first conquistadores to reach the Sun Valley, which is where Phoenix is located, met with, their first contact was with a tribe that they gave the name Sinagua to because to their their colonial imagination, they couldn't imagine how these people lived without water, so they assumed they lived without water and thus gave them the name Sinagua. Um, of course, they were wrong. Um, anyhow, I claimed that title, um, that name from them and used it to sort of work with this new narrative of scarcity. Um, so now I'm going to play you a five minute excerpt um, and if time permits, show you a little bit more. Serpiente blanca, reloj despertador. A windy valley under a poisoned sun. As I write this, a white cover of heat wave plays at a CVS pharmacy. I bought three different bottles of water. Sparkling, black, coconut. I have never been this thirsty how people built canals to stretch the reach of the Rio Salado to drink and to grow things. On the canals, they were thieves. They are the people who built this city. Yo llegué a Phoenix como eso de las 10 de la noche. Compartió un lift más o menos sin ganas con un muchacho joven. I walked in 107 degree heat to a super. It was horrible. I I wanted to get them water, but no hay agua. No hay agua para todo el mundo. Pero a mí me preocupa mi mamá. Mi abuela se acababa de morir. La mamá de mi mamá. 
Get on with your focus argument. You're the only nigga one here. I talked to M via FaceTime. Yeah. I jokingly referred to this place as hell. Yeah, that's right. It represents blood. That represents blood spilled by Native Americans protecting this land from the invaders. He perceives the colonizer in his human status in the world. No pude haber sabido en este momento lo que venía. I feel like I'm in the courtyard of a futuristic Medina. The word monsoon, which they use for rain here, comes from Arabic. Be more careful and not get caught the next time. The white man worships the god of greed. He invented the alarm clock and is now a slave to it. Everything he does, he does according to the clock. He gets up by the clock, he eats by the clock, he works by the clock and goes to bed by the clock. He, he is a slave entirely to the clock. The Indian life... Otro huracán se avecina a Puerto Rico y nadie está en casa otra vez. María le han puesto. Qué nombre. Madre de Dios. Levante, salve, salve. Got the symbolic of the ending of a major phase of aspect of your life. It may bring the beginning of something far more valuable. El Señor, el Señor es contigo. Y bendita. I'll just say that the piece ended up taking its timing from the hurricane, so it's a three-part piece. This is before, um, during, and after are still in production. Um, they, part one did end up being part of this installation um, where thieves go after death, which incorporates the tritus and organic material collected during the production of the video, as well as prints from text exchanges that happened right after I could regain um, communication with my family. Um, and yeah, the installation closed for me a loop on this fragmented landscape and meta narrative. Um, simple interventions like this served as a sort of altar, um, untethered to time, and in a way, a, re a remaking of the of what I perceived as these sort of problematic monuments. Um, instead, replacing them with interventions like this um, to kind of take over what I saw as the city's impossible and imposing colonial architecture. Thank you. Jaskier and Dylan will be our next speaker. I mean, I'm going to flip the... Right? Or something. <laughs> anyway. Um, so I'd like to begin today by thanking the conference organizers for inviting me to be here part of, as part of this discussion today and to my co-panelists for their insightful and incredible work um, from which I've had the privilege of learning. I'd also like to start today by respectfully acknowledging that this event is taking place on the ancestral homelands of the Lenape people here in Manahata, or what is now known as New York City. Entropy, a process of degradation or running, da running down, a trend to disorder. In the spring of 2016, the Standing Rock Sioux waged an epic resistance effort against the Dakota Access Pipeline 
more widely known as DAPL. First made public in 2014, the Dakota Access Pipeline is a $3.7 billion, 1,172 mile underground oil pipeline that runs from six sites in the Bakken and Three Forks oil producing regions of North Dakota through South Dakota and Iowa to Southern Illinois. In Pakota, Illinois, Dapple's terminus and a key Midwest transportation hub, the pipeline links into a network of other lines that are con connected to refineries in the Midwest and along the Gulf Coast. As both a scholar and political organizer committed to supporting Indigenous nations in their struggle against settler colonialism and the occupation of their homelands, coupled with my growing interest in climate justice, I felt a particular sense of responsibility to heed the call for support that was widely broadcasted by tribal members and my Indigenous comrades, some, some of whom were from the region. My first trip to the reservation and the area just outside of it where the largest resistance camp had been assembled along the banks of the Cannonball River was in August of 2016, and when I arrived there, I discovered the largest police presence, U.S. Marshals, FBI, and state police I had ever witnessed in Indigenous North America. The police had blockaded the highway to Standing Rock with cement barricades, cement barricades that were lined with heavily armed officers and military personnel. Apart from the police that were present at the barricade itself, there were also police units stationed up and down the highway, including on the alternative road, which forced you to take a rather circuitous route before reaching the reservation on a gravel unpaved road. On this visit, I also met some of the incredible young people who were central figure, figures in leading this resistance, which is what I'm gonna speak about today. There is a scarcity of platforms that make space for Indigenous youth to represent themselves and speak out back to the stories of risk and crisis that circulate about them. While Indigenous young people's lives are mediated by and through ongoing settler colonialism, to be sure, they also embody and demonstrate tremendous strength and political resistance in their everyday existence and ingenuity create, and creative opposition to structural violence that often goes unnoticed or is tactically downplayed by the state and colonial media representations of them and their communities. Situated at the intersection of precarity and possibility, indigenous youth are makers of something I'm beginning to interpret as anti-colonial entropy, a networked set of ideas, beliefs, and organizing efforts crucial to fostering a political condition of decolonial disorder in our current reality of racial capitalism, violent state sovereignty, and a persistent avowal of present future where white settler power reigns supreme. Anti-colonial entropy promotes degradation of the social and political infrastructure necessary to sustain white settler society. It is necessarily unsettling, anti-hegemonic, and anchored to the political goal of native liberation and the liberation of all oppressed peoples. This anti-colonial entropy could be readily witnessed in the Standing Rock Sioux struggle against the Dakota Access Pipeline. The ecologies of decolonial organizing, the political strategies indigenous youth deployed to produce chaos and disorder in the colonial present were many, but a few stood out to me as especially noteworthy as I watched the mobilization against DAPL unfold. <clears throat> First, Indigenous youth organizing in Standing Rock involved bringing subjugated knowledges forward and elevating silence narratives about contemporary Native life. Aaron Wise, a prominent youth organizer at Standing Rock, explained the importance of lifting up these perspectives when she remarked, quote, no one realizes that the repercussions of colonization have been the repercussions of forced removal. In a similar vein, youth organizer Zaysha Grinnell explained to me that, quote, native women and girls are put into an even more risky position because of the extractive industries, and this is part of how native peoples have been treated for a long time in this country. I learned this from my dad and my grandma. It was passed down. Through a constellation of decolonial counterscripts, indigenous youth consistently demonstrated that the struggle against DAPL was also against a struggle against the violent materialism of what it means to live and breathe, to exist within colonial systems and structures, and that these experiences are intergenerational, moving back and forth in time. Importantly, this resurrection of colonial history, as explained by young people like Wise and Grinnell, initiates a direct confronta confrontation with the United States as a country founded through genocide, land theft, and slavery. 
Indigenous young people also embodied ways of being in relation to one another as, as humans existing amongst and within an other than human world through their embodied actions of living in ceremony in the resistance camps, praying, feeding the sacred fire, taking collective walks in honor of the sacredness of the land, water, and air, and holding water ceremonies, Indigenous young people reframed the battle as a battle for an ethics of living that gives equal weight to human and other than human relations, including plants, animals, elemental forces, and the cosmos as constituents of a collective whole. They positioned water as kinship instead of resource, explicitly challenging the human nature dualism that has marked notions of civilization and time and progress since the colonial founding of the United States. This too serves as a fundamental challenge to colonial relations of domination. And finally, Indigenous young people at Standing Rock were demanding a future that is accountable to them and the generations yet to be born. They made it clear that silence and complicity are no longer and never have been acceptable in the face of colonial violence. This sentiment was beautifully captured in an interview I conducted with LaDonna Brave Bull Allard, founder of the Sacred Stone Camp. When I asked about the role of youth at Standing Rock, she told me, quote, when things started happening against Dapple, it was the youth who ran the chants, the youth who ran the marches, and the youth that we followed. We have to listen to them. They are fighting for the right to live. They are fighting for the right to have water. They are fighting for their future. They are fighting for their children, for what comes next. I believe these young people stood up to heal a nation, and that's what I see them doing. So it is and always has been them and their words. There is power in these youth. There is power and ceremony in what they speak. When they speak, they speak the truth." End quote. Indigenous youth organizing and political mobilization at Standing Rock can be read as stories of refusal, self-affirmation, and strategic resistance to colonial power, all of which fuel decolonial disorder and disorganization in the colonial machinery that sustains the status quo and promotes business as usual. They are at the forefront of educating and supporting their communities, as well as the public sphere, and tra transcending key sites of colonial trauma and violence. And more importantly, they help us to decipher what it means to be an Indigenous young person growing up in occupied United States while asserting priorities for decolonization. They live these priorities in the everyday and map pathways that chart how Indigenous young people are already actively working towards transforming their own futures. To put it succinctly, these Indigenous youth are part of a much larger network, political network of young people across the world that are threading together and sustaining the anti-colonial entropy necessary for revolutionary liberation that will bring forth alternative forms of existence on the planet. In doing so, the bravery and brilliance of these young people should compel all of us to ask ourselves what we are willing to fight for. Thanks. <laughs> And hi, it's another Sophia and another Boricua on the panel. There's two of us. Um, so I'm going to start with a video um, of the work that I do in my hometown of Puerto Rico, my home country. Damn. I'm supposed to be really tech savvy. It's, it was ah, going ya empezó. Disculpen. Necesito ayuda. I think after Maria, there was a loss of words, at least for me, and I think for so many Puerto Ricans, right? And, and in that process of losing words, there is also the process of trying to search for words that can make you feel like you are a part of a collective and that there are other humans in the world that have gone through what you're going through, right? And for me, I found those words in a just transition. Um, whomever created it, it doesn't even matter. That, that concept, um, that search for justice, right? That, that belief in that transitions can be just, right? That you can, that you can discover justice in the process of recovery. That is what I believe in.
team of women at La Maraña came together after the hurricanes, each of us was facing a whirlwind of questions and hurt. Yet despite that hurt, we sat down to imagine how our collective skills can channel the sense of justice we all desired for ourselves and our home. Inspired by the unimaginably encouraging community-led efforts that were mushrooming across the island, we dared to put our fears aside and transform our trauma into a space of collective healing and growth. That was the day Imaginación Post Maria was born. A six-step community participatory recovery model that offers citizens direct power to imagine, plan, and construct the future they desire for their communities. The first steps involve identifying community collaborators and attending the community's most pressing needs in the wake of a disaster. Through direct community engagement and quick action brigades, local leaders take charge of gathering information and forming hubs to undertake rapid relief to serve the most impacted. The focus then shifts towards defining long-term community needs and mapping out local talents and resources. Imagination workshops and participatory processes then become the building blocks to create a master plan that embodies the community's collective vision for a just recovery. In that final stage, the community is able to materialize their dreams by voting and receiving a grant to launch their own social impact project. In essence, this process teaches us that we are not only capable of imagining a different world, but ultimately capable of materializing those dreams into concrete long-term solutions. In collaboration with three diverse communities, La Vuelta del Dos y Los Guaretos in Comerío, San Anton in Carolina, and Mariana in Umacao, we are bringing Imaginación Post Maria to life. For the next year, we will be walking on this journey together, deciphering how our personal paths towards a just recovery can inspire and spark future bottom-up grassroots efforts across the island. Imaginación Post Maria is our daring leap to believe in our ability to create justice for ourselves. Join us in raising funds as we discover and shape a Puerto Rico designed by Puerto Ricans. When Hurricane Maria made landfall, gracias. Gracias, 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 gracias. I feel so humbled. It was a year ago when I arrived in New York and came to propose the Imaginación Post Maria to people who could make our dreams a reality. And it's a year later, and I'm sitting here, and I'm really grateful. Um, so we'll start. When Hurricane Maria made landfall on Puerto Rico, most Puerto Ricans coming from the Caribbean understood what natural disaster was. But what we did not understand, or what my... <laughs> 29-year-old brain could not understand were the perils of the second hurricane that would come and that continues to ravish the island every single day. And that is a man-made disaster, disaster capitalism. It is the intensifying and unleashing of crippling and unjust austerity measures that threaten the very fabric of our culture, our identity, and our home. When that happens, and when you're in an island in the midst of disaster, magic happens at the same time, right? And that's when community enclaves become the people and the leaders that teach us that recovery can happen in a different way, and that there are other ways of living in the world, and there are other futures to construct, right? And so a battle starts between both of these narratives and both of these ideas of what a recovery can look like. And it is within that battle that we envisioned Imaginación Post Maria, right? We decided to unite ourselves with the community-led movements and figure out how to harness radical imagination as a way to envision and define what justice means for us as Boricuas. A year and a half after Hurricane Maria and after the loving and beautiful and daring and hard, intense work of working with three amazing and daring communities on the ground, we've realized that our impact is twofold. When we work on community organizing and when you offer communities the opportunity um, for them to harness that imagination into concrete work, 
you not only impact the communities directly and not, uh, do not, we not only find ways to use participatory processes to build parks and to re-envision private houses through collective imagination or to literally create maps as big as this table so that people can place their talents and their resources and figure out what the fuck justice means for them and what the fuck recovery means when your life is toppled, right? So it's not only what happens on the ground, it's how what happens on the ground becomes a reflection of what it is that we want. What type of government do we want when we're a colony? What type of government do we want when we have a fiscal control board that threatens the very essence of a democracy and the power of voting within the context of a federal US colony, right? Just to put it in place, right? So, and what we've discovered is that these communities and the communities that outside of Imaginación Post Maria, not only the ones we're working with, right, become a metaphor of systemic change, right? So when we, in, when we integrate the idea of a collective voting process within a community, a consensus making process, when we offer a grant for people to decide what it is that they want to implement, then we're healing the process of voting. We're saying, no, fiscal control board, you cannot define what our reality looks like. We know what we want and we know how to implement it. Right? So there's a process of healing that's necessary. And although we're a very small scale uh, organization, hence why my voice is still the voice that you're hearing, um, the, the idea right, that we are also a metaphor of how funds and power should be distributed. right? Because as the billions roll in but are being washed away so that we can continue to pay Wall Street bondholders that illegally have us at a $72 billion debt, Right? Our implementation is 80, our, our organization runs 85% of all of our funds directly to the communities and directly to implementation costs. Two thirds of our staff are community leaders and community construction workers. In essence, what we're saying is that our micro forms of disaster recovery are what we want on a macro level. It means that money needs to be distributed differently. It means that power needs to be distributed differently. And in essence, thank you, that our recovery needs to be different, right? And, and one of, in sitting next to these two amazing women and thinking about anti-colonial entropy, which just blew my mind, um, and going back to La Maraña, uh, which is the name of the nonprofit that um, me and a group of, of you know, really beautiful humans uh, began in 2014, La Maraña is an Afro-Latin word which means entangled web. Um, and, right, and, and again, when, when a country is, is dismantled, when you wake up the next day and realize that your whole life changed, you realize that in order to reconstruct, you need thread, you need a needle, and you need to start sewing the future, right? And when we began and when we created La Maraña five years ago, we thought of it as a platform that could unite the nodes of independent um, movement building, right? So we saw what we thought would be a nascent social movement and that almost became even more real as Maria arrived and our communities needed to struggle even further and be more resilient, right? And so I think the invitation, right, is, is what do we do with that maraña? What do we do with that network of people that are envisioning a different future, right? And what, and I guess the invitation for this year and for everyone who's on the ground working for relief is how do we sow all of these narratives together? And how do we discover that the systems that we're putting in place in communities are the systems that we need to replicate on a larger scale? And they are the ones that are gonna offer a roadmap as to what it is that we want our future to be. Um, so yeah, thank you. I want to thank you all. Those were incredibly inspiring words and uh, films and, and works. So thank you for that. Um, and I just want to pick up a little bit on the comment that you were making, Sophia, about radical imagination and maybe ask all of you to continue to, th to think through this thread of what 
what kinds of specific things can we talk about when we think about radical imagination? How can we really continue these works through art making, through networking youth? Um, you've had such amazing examples, but I think that if you just, I invite you to continue with maybe some specific strategies because each example you've already given has been so rich. Um, yeah, that's hard. I mean, there's so many examples, um, and specifically that one that I talked about, healing the voting process, actually came out of a community meeting where we were talking. We had an, uh, a crew of um, queer and trans folk coming in from California to Puerto Rico to do a, a day brigade, and that was the conversation that the community leaders talked about was, you know, what does it mean for, for voting to be reappropriated and reclaimed, right? Especially in a world where you seem like your vote doesn't count, right? And especially within the context of a colonial dictatorship, right? Um, but another really concrete example is that, and what's been so beautiful is that everything we read on the news it is what is what ends up becoming the work that leaders are doing on the ground, right? So I don't know if y'all know, but since um, since the you know discovery of our crazy debt, um, 400 schools have been closed on the ground, public health has been slashed, 60% of our FEMA applications were denied, which is doubled in comparison to Texas after Harvey, which was 30% uh, denial rate. Um, so we're talking about literally a dismantling of the public sector so that we invite a fiscal paradise for American Wall Street cronies, right? And, and when schools are closed, right, that's the work that ends up happening on the ground. It's schools are closing, so then the community is then organizing around how to activate abandoned, abandoned schools and how to offer their people just education, which is the case of Carolina. In the case of Umagao, um, they've literally garnered all of their resources around disaster preparedness because they were the municipality that was hit and they were left a year without electricity, right? So they had to take on um, the role of doing what the state needed to do, right? Which was <laughs> figure out how recovery can be just. And in the case of Comerio, which is the third community that we're working with, they're, um, they literally are almost bound to, to crazy contamination of their river because their sewer system was not well done by the public sector and constant flooding because they have a bridge that's become almost like an informal dam. And now youth leaders are are literally applying to funds to figure out how to create a water and energy sustainable plan for their community, right? So it's, I think what's amazing about art, right, is that, and what was spoken about with the keynote speaker is that the battleground of imagination is where we learn to be free and where we learn that we deserve that. So I think that's really, for me, what that thread is, is bringing those ideas and harnessing them into concrete projects. Yeah, to sort of follow up on that, I, you know, the question in a sense is an impossibility because I want this idea of radical imagination to exist in plurality from its outset, um, but to sort of marry all of our interests and to take what you're talking about, you know, um, a lot of what the hurricane brought to light has been extremely painful. Um, what happened after the hurricane, the complete collapse of a state that commands every aspect of our life but cannot take care of anybody became so mm -hmm. eminently clear that it started to do this really interesting thing where, and we talk about, you know, in activism and art and whatever, we're always using this word community and I think that it's been used to this place where it, its meaning has kind of become really soft. Mm. And through mm -hmm. the sort of tearing open of that wound and other wounds, you know, a lot has come to light in painful ways, again, like blackness and anti-blackness in the Caribbean and all of these things have had to come up so we have to deal with them. But we kind of returned to this place where there was this forced moment of mutual aid that brought us to this place of like, whatever, true community, like at the risk of using the word truth, um, but like true community, right? And it started to do something really interesting, right? It started to close the gap um, that power really invests in, in keeping us from one another. And so I think that I don't have like a concrete answer for what does like radical imagination perform in this in the future, other than 
this moment of people having to rely on one another, as painful as it has been, has brought us to this place where folks are having conversations that no longer have to be kept within the brackets of what is like possible in like a state mandated, mandated situation because that situation went away. Mm. You know, so now we can do whatever, right? <laughs> Anarchy. Yeah, and I think just <laughs> just to sort of follow up on what both Sophia and Sophia <laughs> just said, um, I think part of what you're getting at is this idea of you have to be able to build relationships with people, right? So radical imagination partly emerges from radical relationality. Mm -hmm. How do you build connections with one another? How do you have conversations that are real, that are deep, that actually look at people's history to place and land and long-standing relationships to struggles of resistance. And then from that, you, you get radical action. So I'm a huge proponent of like really thinking hard about the kinds of relationships we develop with people, which is partly right when you collapse that gap in the isolation that people have in their own like worlds and ways of being and living, then you develop different kinds of relationships. Yeah. Thank you so much. Maybe we should open up the, um, the questions to the audience. Do we have any on um, email? No, okay. Then we'll take the mic around. And if anybody has a question, we'd love to hear it. Hi, I just wanted to uh, thank you for the presentation and um, uh, I wanted to take you back to one of my heroes, Paulo Ferreri, who wrote Pedagogy of the Oppressed. Mm -hmm. And you know the colonial history is about um, uh, people who have been oppressed in Puerto Rico before the storm. And I, I watched the PBS special, the documentary on the financial travesty you're talking about. And uh, so when you understand all the dynamics, you know, Paulo Ferreri's great contribution was the Christian contribution of uh, love your enemies. So you know what they did, you know how they were. How do you love them and oppose them at the same time so that you empower yourself sometimes not to be twisted by uh, the hate which you can develop when you see what people have done and when you remember it. So it's kind of a general question. Uh, does, does that make sense? And that, that understanding that in, in, in opposing this, how do you do something constructive without being twisted by the anger? I don't know. I mean, I think we're in a position where it's not about being twisted by the anger. I think that anger is a really powerful tool in the situation that we find ourselves in. And this kind of goes back to another question that was asked earlier, sort of this idea of like where, but where's the empathy? And it's like, well, where has the empathy been for Puerto Rico? You know, and it's like, it's not a matter of like, well, it has to be one for one and one for the other, but I just feel like it's a really gray area to sort of dance in. And I think that to sort of uh, approximate an answer, a lot of the relief efforts that are happening on the ground with projects like La Maraña or, you know, in an idealized world in the more imaginary space that I'm sort of trying to work in, it's less about focusing on a, a condemnation but looking at a web of inequity that has led to this moment and then not focusing on each specific grievance, but looking at what's at the root of it. And the what's at the root of it is pretty rotten. You know, it has to be torn out. Um, and I don't know what that means. That means something really different for everybody. Um, but I do think that in this particular instance, anger is actually part of the soup and it has to be. Um, are there any other questions from the audience? It's hard to see you all, so that's I mean, fine. I okay, great, thank you. Uh, hi, thank you for your talks. 
And my question is, um, if you could imagine that all your plans go well, all your wishes, actions kind of line up and go to a, a good end to where you want them to go, can you give like a glimpse of what you envision? <laughs> no, that's hard. Um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's a good question, and I feel like it's something that I grapple with um, uh, all the time. And I feel like everyone who's on, who's in Puerto Rico doing uh, this work, because there's so many of us, um, grapple with that all the time. And I think coming back to what I spoke about, I feel like, uh, and even going back to the first question, there are days where I wake up and anger is so intense that I don't want to look at Americans walking down the street because they're moving in the hundreds to our land, right? It's like an island-wide Brooklyn gentrification project, um, right? So it's literally like we're losing it all. And I feel like although we don't have the answers and there's a part of me that's like, well, are we able, gonna, are we gonna be able to do it? Like, what is this all? Like, it feels so wishy-washy sometimes and then it feels so concrete. And I feel like with the anger for me, it's been about really just trusting this like part of me, like in my gut that tells me I need space and time to think and to do and to like be safe. And so that's why it's hard to read the news sometimes and I'll just like covet into going and doing the work in the communities and just staying there and not interacting with Americans on a day to day because it's too painful to do it. Um, and so I think I don't know what the answer is, but I know that the solutions are happening now. And having the space and the time to be able to put the anger aside, but also offer me a space where I don't need to, to be you know, torn by that anger constantly and where our people don't need to be torn by that anger constantly, is that's where we're figuring it out. So yeah, it looks like participatory governance. It looks like offering public funds to community leaders rather than just senators and legislators. It looks like, it looks like voting that, 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 that means a project rather than this ephemeral person that's going to solve all of our problems, right? And maybe it looks quantum-esque, whatever it was talked about this morning, which I loved. But what I do know is that now is the time to go inside and literally just allow ourselves to create and then allow ourselves the just space to think because countries are not created while you're being attacked. You need time. It takes time to build a country in the 21st century when you're still a colony. And so that's why these enclaves are so important is because we're practicing the revolution and we're doing it all at once. So um, yeah, so I don't know what it looks like, but we're gonna figure it out, I hope. Yeah, and I would also add to that, I mean, I think if we want to think about how this starts, especially on a, in a country that is a settler colony, you know, how about starting with the upholding of treaty rights? How about the 500 plus treaties that were signed with the native people of these homelands that have been violated over and over and over and over again by the US government? How about different kinds of relationships to the land, water, and air that we call resources? Mm -hmm. How about we no longer have multinational corporations that actually run our governments? How about the collapse of US empire yeah. worldwide and the transnational ongoing kinds of imperialism that people all over the global south have to live with every day that are intimately linked to our lives here? Mm -hmm. Yes, to all Yeah, that. and the ridding of our debt, the forgiveness of our debt the opening up of our borders, we still don't have free trade agreements in the 21st century. Like, we need a free, econ a free economy for us, not ruled by the US. We need to be able to build our own systems. And so, you know, getting rid of that debt would be real great. <laughs> <laughs> and to offer the more sort of abstracted view of what it looks like <laughs> and offer a non-answer, I can't say what it looks like because I'm really invested in this being a project that is mm. all about our collective imaginings. And to really honor that, I think there has to be no outline. And I think that that's massively terrifying, right? Like we are, we are like in the arts, if you say the word imagination, you're put into this like corny corner. And it's like, <laughs> but without this very essential thing, there is no way out of this shit. 
And there is no way out of this, you know, everything that you just all outlined. So like, I'm even, I'm, a, I'm my like special great future doesn't even include borders, right? It's like this internationalist project where we're just working along the lines of what do people need and how do we make people get that and not just get that, but feel like they're part of the process of getting that. That it's not about having to have some sort of like colonial overseer walk you to that because they're never gonna do it. So to not answer that, um, it's, all, it's, it's all about sort of releasing the imaginary as like an actual potential tool. Mm. Thank you. I, I think I'm getting the, oh, the signal. If we have time for just one more question maybe? Or comment maybe. No? Then thank you all. This has been really <laughs> incredible and helpful and inspiring. Thank you. Thank you.